Well hello there space friends. Let's explore a 3D star map based on real life including important star systems, nebula, and other locations with locations in the Star Trek universe. Such as where would planets like Vulcan be relative to Earth? And where are the spheres of influence of major interstellar civilizations such as the Romulans, the Klingons, or even the Borg? Of course there are many fictional locations in the Star Trek galaxy that do not align with reality, so we will have a bit of fun with it. Imagine just how interesting the writing for Star Trek or other hardcore sci-fi would be if the writers were at least aware of our location relative to other locations in the galaxy, both fictional and non-fictional. Alright, let's start by taking a look at the galaxy as a whole. In real life, Sol, or our sun, sits here between the Sagittarius Arm and the Perseus Arm in a trail of stars called the Orion Spur. In Star Trek, the Milky Way galaxy is divided into four quadrants. The Alpha and Beta quadrants include the closest locations to Earth, which is where most Star Trek adventures take place. The Alpha and Beta quadrants aren't fully explored, but they include what is considered explored space in Star Trek. The Delta Quadrant is mostly unexplored, but is where Voyager and Captain Janeway were transported by the advanced Ancient Caretaker Array and forced to start a long journey home. Voyager managed to explore a lot of the locations along this journey that were along their course back home. The Delta Quadrant is also the home to the Borg Collective. The Gamma Quadrant is mostly unexplored and unknown until the wormhole at Bajor is discovered, which leads to the Gamma Quadrant. The Gamma Quadrant is home to the highly advanced and dangerous civilization known as the Dominion, and the discovery of the Dominion would lead to an enormous war with the Alpha Quadrant powers. But for now, we're going to focus on our Sun and the local nearby systems. A lot of the information I've gathered about Star Trek locations come from the book called Star Trek Star Charts, and it's an excellent reference for our purposes. It may conflict with other star maps, the earlier ones that were mostly printed before the TNG area. It may also conflict with star maps from Star Trek Online. And there may be some contradictions, especially since many of those maps only show a flat two-dimensional image. This is just something that the human mind can grasp a little bit easier. But we're not going to do that here. We know space is very three-dimensional, so that's how we're going to have it. I think you'll also be surprised by how long it takes to travel to even nearby systems at a standard cruising speed of warp 6, which is 392.5 times the speed of light. Most starships cruise at far below their maximum speed to avoid wear and tear on their engines, but yes for plot convenience, it seems that sometimes our starships go much faster than they should be. For nerds like myself, this destroys my immersion in the universe, but anyway, Let's start with our sun and talk about the home systems of the five founders of the Federation of Planets, which are Vulcan, Andor, Teller, and Alpha Centauri. First, Vulcan. The Vulcan system in real life is called 40 Iridani on most star charts in the constellation Iridanus, but the star is called Keed. In real life, it's 16.3 light years from our sun. It would take the Enterprise D at warp 6, which is 392.5 times the speed of light, about 15 days to get to Vulcan from Sol. This probably mostly checks out with the Star Trek universe, but Scotty claims in Star Trek The Motion Picture that they can reach Vulcan in a couple of days. To do that, they would have to travel at about warp 14 in the old series warp scale, or somewhere around warp 9.7 in the TNG scale, so this is unlikely. 40 Iridani's main star has a spectral type that is K1, which means it's a bit more orange in color than our own sun. It may surprise you to know that the real-life Iridani system is a trinary system. K8 is orbited by a binary pair of stars, which is a white dwarf orbited by an even smaller red dwarf. Vulcan is the second planet that orbits the primary star, Iridani A. But it seems to be considered something of a binary planet along with Tikal, which also has a moon, whereas Vulcan does not. Right now we have no idea about the nature of the real-life planets in the 40 Iridani system. Now onto Andor, or Andoria, home system of the feisty, blue-skinned Andorians. Apparently the home system of Andor, according to Star Trek star charts, is Procyon. Procyon is a late-stage F or white star, 
the eighth brightest star in our sky and in the constellation Canis Minor. It is 11.46 light years from Earth and would take almost 11 days at warp 6 for the Enterprise D to travel there from Earth. Procyon has a companion star, Procyon B, which is a very faint white dwarf. The Andorian planet itself in Star Trek is apparently more Arctic than Earth. Again, here we're not sure about real life planets around Procyon. Now on to Teller, or the home of the bullheaded but somewhat pig-like Tellarites. The Tellarite system is, in real life, the star 61 Cygni, another binary star in the constellation of Cygnus. It's 11.4 light years from Earth, similar to the distance of Andor, which would take the Enterprise about 11 days to reach it from Earth at warp 6. 61 Cygni consists of two K-type or orange dwarf stars that orbit each other. On to Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is the closest star system from Earth at 4.2 light years. In Star Trek, it's referred to as one and the same as the habitable planet in the system, which was colonized by Earth in the late 21st century and later became one of the founders of the Federation. Alpha Centauri is in the southern constellation of Centaurus and is actually a trinary star system consisting of two sun-like G stars, Rigel Centaurus and Ptolemon, and an outlier orbiting red dwarf M-type star called Proxima Centauri. In real life, we've detected planets around Proxima Centauri, including one in the habitable zone about the size of Earth, although we currently have no indication that it's habitable. The problem with M-type stars is they're terribly unstable and prone to sun flares. Nevertheless, it could be the location of the first colony in Star Trek, or it could be another planet in the Alpha Centauri area. The distance to our nearest star can be traveled to at warp 6 in less than 4 days. Another place of note near our system is the Wolf 359 system. In Star Trek, this was the setting of the battle with the Borg versus about 30 Starfleet ships in the Star Trek Next Generation episode, Best of Both Worlds, and Starfleet got wrecked. Wolf 359 is a faint Class M red dwarf, about 7.86 light years from Earth, and it would take the Enterprise D at warp 6 to reach it in about 7 days. All right, now we need to zoom way out and talk about the boundaries of the Federation itself. And this is where the numbers can get pretty mind-blowing. Now, Sol sits right between the Alpha and Beta quadrants, but is considered to be in the Alpha quadrant, while the Federation consists of parts of both the Alpha and Beta quadrants. According to Picard in the Star Trek movie First Contact, the United Federation of Planets in the TNG era spans a whopping 10,000 light years. But hang on a second, let's think about that. It would take the Enterprise D at its usual cruising speed of warp 6 25 years to travel across the Federation, and at its maximum speed of warp 9.6, which is 1,909 times the speed of light, about 5 years to travel across it. This area is a lot considering that the galaxy is only 100,000 light years in diameter, but the Star Trek star charts say something different here, and it makes a little more sense that the local bubble of explored space is about 1,500 light years across which would take the Enterprise at warp 6 just shy of 4 years to make that journey. I think Picard added an extra zero in error when he said the Federation traverses 10,000 light years. But according to the maps, the coreward areas of the Federation are kind of squished in from various other interstellar powers, and the Federation expands towards the rim of the galaxy alongside the Klingon Empire. But let's look at one of the earliest antagonists to the Earth, which was the Romulan Star Empire. According to the two-dimensional maps, the Romulan Star of Romulus is about 50 light years from Earth, but also on the map appearing very close to the real-life star of Epsilon Phoenicia, which is 144 light years. I figure, well, why would they put a star, a real star, on a star chart unless it's pretty close to Romulus? We can only really speculate here, but I think it's more interesting to go tall and put Romulus somewhere about 140 light years from Earth, raising up from the Z axis. It would take the Enterprise at warp 6 to get to Romulus about 4 months. And we only know that it has two inhabited planets, Romulus and Ramus. Now the Romulans seem to have expanded their territory mostly in the direction of the Galactic Rim as well, and somewhat adjacent to Earth and Vulcan, but also towards the Klingon Empire. But I believe it's, to some degree, over on top of the Federation. 
The Romulan neutral zone on maps consists of a ridiculous two-dimensional corridor, but it's more likely to be something like a, a wall that cordons off Romulan space. Now, very similar to the Romulans, the Klingon homeworld of Kronos doesn't have a real-life star, but it seems to be very close to the real-life star, Theta Hydrae, and that's 115 light-years from Earth. So we'll put Kronos at about 120 light-years from Earth, which would take the Enterprise-D at warp 6, 111 days to reach. I will note that, for some strange reason, in the Star Trek Enterprise episode Broken Arrow, it only takes three days for the most primitive version of the Enterprise to reach Kronos. This is terrible writing. Writers really just don't quite understand the perspectives and distances of space travel. The Klingon Empire does not expand forward much at all, but instead goes far rimward for some reason. There is far more Federation space than Klingon space between Sol and Kronos. Maybe this is why the Klingons were so ornery towards the Federation. Also a plate of note is Kittimer, where the peace accords between the Federation and the Klingons were signed. Kittimer is near the border of the Federation space, about 15 light years forward of Kronos. Now let's talk about the Orions, the Orion constellation, and the stars Beta Orionis or Rigel, because this gets to be really confusing, but fun. Captain Pike mentioned in the original series The Cage, and also The Menagerie, that maybe he'd retire to the Orion colonies. And what does this mean? Well, don't believe anything you see on the Star Trek Wikipedias or even the star charts, because most of the objects in the Orion constellation, which includes Rigel, are hundreds of light years away. In fact, Beta Orionis, otherwise understood to be Rigel, is a blue star 850 light years away. This is unlikely to be what Pike was referring to, because it would take a ship like the Enterprise years to reach Rigel. What is more likely is that the Orions and the Orion colonies are centered on the Pi 3 Orionis star, which is the brightest star of the lion's head that Orion is holding in that constellation. And Pi 3 Orionis is only 26.3 light years away from our sun, which would take the Enterprise at warp 6 cruising speed about 24 days to reach it from Earth. Pi 3 Orionis is an F6 star which burns brighter and more white than our own sun. And this is most likely the area everyone is referring to when mentioning the Orion colonies. Alright, now if we head over to the Alpha Quadrant, we need to find Deep Space Nine, which is in the Bajor system. Now I've looked and looked, but can't find any real-life star reference that helps us find the Bajor location. And we know that it's upspin and rimward from Sol, in two dimensions, which is about 100 light years, but more likely further in three dimensions, so we'll say that this is about 110 light years distance from our sun, which would take a galaxy class starship at warp 6, 102 days or upwards of three months to get there. Now Cardassia is very close to Bajor, relatively speaking, pretty much right in the backyard in less than 10 light years. The Cardassian Union space bulges towards the Federation space with a demilitarized zone encapsulating the downspin reach of the Cardassian territory. Now we look forward of Cardassian space, and here we find Ferenginar, the homeworld of the Ferengi. But this is where we stop getting good coverage in the Star Trek Star Charts book, and there aren't many Star Charts regarding this area that I can find. We do know that Ferenginar is somewhere in this area, and it's about equal distance from Sol as Bajor, so somewhere upwards of 100 light years meaning it will take about three months to reach it at warp six. But beyond Ferenginar, another 100 light years or so, in the same relative direction from Earth, is a mysterious Breen confederacy in Breen. And apparently the Romulans have had more contact with the Breen than the Federation. So for this reason, I've expanded the Breen territory to go over the Federation on the Z-axis in the third dimension to be kind of close to the Romulan star empire. Now that we have the more or less major features of the Alpha and Beta Quadrants covered, things like real-life nebula may be of some importance. Nebula are encountered quite frequently in Star Trek, such as the Mutara Nebula, which I believe to be a stellar nursery, and the Azure Nebula, which sits between the Romulan and Klingon empires. Now in real life, something like the Bernard's Nebula, or 
Bernard's Loop, which is a vast nebula, starts at about 518 light years distance, and that's pretty far from where most Star Trek stories take place. This means, unfortunately, all these nebula, like the Matara Nebula and the Azul Nebula, are probably pure fiction. So back to the Bajoran wormhole. This, of course, leads to the Gamma Quadrant. The terminus is about 90,000 light years distance from Bajor. Let's increase the cruising speed of a ship to warp 8 to reach the end, which might be more applicable to ships like the Intrepid class, like Voyager, to calculate the travel time. This is now 1,024 times the speed of light, and it would take about 87 years to travel that distance. Although in Deep Space Nine, they say it would take about 67 years at high warp, but no one in their right mind would run a starship nonstop at high warp for decades. Of course, the Dominion would invade through this wormhole throughout the later seasons of Deep Space Nine. Now let's get into Star Trek Voyager's journey, which starts in the Badlands, not far from Deep Space Nine, and I have no clue what kind of stellar phenomenon the Badlands is supposed to be in real life, other than some arbitrary, cool space art. But the ancient and advanced caretaker chose this area as one of its extraction sites, snatching ships from here and flinging them all the way across the galaxy to the Ocampa system, some 70,000 light years from Sol, which is in the Delta Quadrant. If Voyager's estimated cruising speed at warp 8 directly and non-stop, which is 1,024 times the speed of light, it would take them 68 years to reach Earth, and according to Janeway, about 75 years. Of course, Voyager would find a way of getting home earlier by using Borg transwarp gates. Now, I could be wrong on this, but I do not believe the Voyager series mentions any real-life locations in the galaxy. But since I could be wrong, that's where you guys can weigh in in the comments section. Now, I must note that the Borg have an enormous area of influence in the Delta Quadrant. So, space friends, I've been wanting to bring some realism and perspective as it relates to space sci-fi for some time to my videos. I really enjoyed making this, and I used the 3D Star Map plugin for Blender. I would love to credit the creator, but I wasn't able to find his name. But if anyone here uses Blender 3D, I will link the Star Map in the description below. There's also a tutorial to the Star Map on YouTube. So tell me, does this give you some enlightening perspective on the locations of objects compared to real life? Please say so in the comments.